When I was in seventh grade, our church got a new pastor, a Northern rural church getting a pastor from urban Ontario. It was a bit of a shock, but he'd been a missionary in Africa. And as a family, they had lived through some of the turbulence of the 1960s as this country moved out of colonial rule to independence, authoritarian rebellion, persecution to get control. And in that setting, the persecution of Christians made it a dangerous place to be. So Northern BC, great fit. We got introduced to some ways of doing real church, like, well, maybe in my memory, it was his first Sunday there. And I woke up at the end of the service by some commotion I was not used to. His words were, let's rise for the benediction. Hold it. What does it mean to rise? I, I knew my Bible language and I, I knew that rising is what we would do someday with Jesus. I didn't know rise was church speak, church speak for stand up. But I rose with the rest of them and I pondered what the meaning of this new word benediction might be. Over the course of time in this new world, I came to decide that benediction must be some formal church speak equivalent of that screen at the end of an old movie, the end. But unlike some movies, the benediction was a very welcome end. I had endured one more service. I, I came to see that standing for the benediction as, as parallel to the well, to the starter gun of a school sports race. When he said, on your mark, set, the precursor to go, which actually was more accurate than seeing the benediction as the end. Benediction. It's a Latin word, a, a, a compound word from two ordinary words, bene, which means well and good, and deser, which is say or speak. The dictionary definition is good, but in language that is a little too formal for me, the, the utterance or bestowing of a blessing. My definition, summary, is that a benediction is a sending prayer of blessing. Now the word benediction is not in the Bible and the Bible does not prescribe a formal order for a church service. But over the years, I have come to appreciate the beauty, the richness and the power of many of the benedictions in the Bible. And I've often pondered them sometimes as banners in my mind at the beginning of a day. God's sending for me into this day. Benediction. It's, it's not an ending prayer. It's a sending prayer, a sending blessing, a summary prayer for the grace to see, to live in and live out and live in light of the truth that we've heard and reflected on about the God who is, who is over us, for us, in us, and already ahead of us as we go into this day, this week, this new season. And so today, on this last Sunday in the role that you have allowed me to assume for the last seven years, our teaching this morning will be a reflection on one of the simple summary benedictions of the Bible. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Paul's sending blessing at the end of the main body of teaching in his letter to the church in Rome. I, if you want to turn to it, it's just one verse, but Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament. It's the first epistle or teaching letter of the New Testament. Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him or as you live believingly so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can think of no better summary of what I pray will be how Ellerslie as a church family can look on our time of journeying together, how you as part of this family will look at the future that we have come to know in a deeper, richer, fuller way, the hope of God, the God of hope, in a way that helps us live each day believingly, 
and be seen as people who overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Knowing how Paul, as a trained scholar, how well he, as, as a trained Jewish scholar, knows how well he knows the Old Testament, knowing what he would have had to process and come to terms with personally in order to embrace Jesus, I'm convinced that the prayer, this prayer is Paul's way of articulating the powerful plea of the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 12 says this, Return to your fortress, your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. That's one of my favorite word pictures in the Bible. Prisoners of hope. It was written, uh, Zechariah was written to a people who had been removed from their land of God's promise, who had settled and, and had become integrated into uh, another land, another culture, who had perhaps in more ways than they even realized adopted the perspectives and accepted the normative practices of the culture in which they lived. Zechariah, the prophet, says, no, 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 look past what you are experiencing now, what you're seeing now, what you're coming to love now. Your heart is telling you there's something more. Don't settle. It's still in the future, but God is faithful. He, he introduces this challenge beginning at, at verse 9 of Zechariah. He says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And because of the vision of this promise comes his plea, return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. A hope that leads to what? Joy and peace, the same words Paul is praying that we will see, a hope that will lead to joy and peace. I, I'd just like us to see one obvious implication from, the prophets, from, from that plea from the prophet Zechariah. And that is that we are all prisoners of something. And the scary thing, although it can be a beautiful thing, is that we get to pick our own prison. We have picked our prison. So what's your prison? Well, duh, COVID is my prison right now. Or as some people might think, the rules, the arbitrary rules, the shifting rules, the unconstitutional rules being imposed on me because of somebody's fear of COVID, that's my prison. And I did not choose that prison. My body is my prison my aging body, my body that's not as beautiful or, or buff as others' body, my body that is out of sync with my experience of myself. That's my prison, and I did not choose that prison. Some of us are perhaps a bit more reflective and insightful, and whether we've admitted it or not, we, we know that our prison comes from the choices we've made. A financial decision I thought was good, but now it has me trapped. A marriage that looked like it would, would, would get me out of my prison, but has become a more restrictive prison. Having young kids, a job I jumped at, but it's not what was promised, and now there's nothing else. You name it. And we're doing all kinds of things to protest that prison, to demand that somebody do something different so I don't feel imprisoned, to make choices that we hope without any real evidence just, just might free me from that prison or sinking into a deeper prison of discouragement, depression, and despair. Okay, maybe I did choose it, but, but there's no way out. What Paul's prayer wish as he closes this book, Paul's summary of the very intense logical theological book is, my prayer wish for you is, as you move from reading this, the truth of the rest of this book, the theology, Understanding this stuff, my hope is that every day, in spite of whatever that comes your way, you, you will realize that you still get to choose your prison, regardless of what you think your prison is. That is not really your prison. And I'm praying that you will pick 
the prisoner, the prison of hope. Today, out of this sending prayer, I'd, I'd like us to just simply see the answer to two big basic questions. Number one, how can I choose the prison of hope every day? A hope that's real and not just a fantasy. And number two, what are the signs that I'm truly choosing the prison of hope? So how can I choose and live in the prison of hope every day? Number one, remember and rehearse in your mind your hope story. It's not just about flipping a switch and having some new dramatic experience and encounter. Sometimes God allows us some powerful experiences, encounters that, that deepen our hope. But those are not regular experiences. And, and the story of faith is littered with people trying to create and package experiential environments that produce feelings of hope. Those, those packaged experiences are not life-changing. They, they just create a demand for more and more experiences. Hope does not come from hype. The hope Paul is praying for is not a feeling. It leads to things that are very feeling-oriented, joy and peace. But hope is not a feeling. Hope is more than wishful thinking, and hope is more than simply having an optimistic personality. That is not what Paul is praying for. He's not saying, I pray that you will, you will still hang on to hope, even though it's not logical, even though it's not probable. I know that because, well, every benediction, just like every statement, has a context. Every time you say goodbye to someone, the words you say when you say goodbye are, are basically a summary of that, that come out of what, what you've talked about as you've been together, of, often one significant piece to it. Sometimes our goodbye is, is in the form of a thank you. Thank you so much for how you came here today and helped me see that. Sometimes it's in the form of a prayer. You know what? I'm going to promise to pray that, and we refer to something specific that we talked about. Sometimes it's, a, it's simply a promise to do something. First thing tomorrow, I'm going to check on whatever it was we talked about. We, we mention it. So that they can move the ball forward. That's the context of our goodbye. So what is the context of, of this benediction? Why this benediction as a sending summary of the book of Romans? Well, we often see... If we've read the book of Romans, we see it as a dense, deep book of theology, right? It's Paul the lawyer building a solid, logical foundation for faith. And yes, that's what Paul does. But what we're reminded of as we read this benediction is why Paul builds that foundation. What it is that Paul is wanting us to see in those theological truths, especially the idea of justification by faith, which is big in this book. What, what he's wanting to do is to help us see our story, remember our true story, and live in the hope of this story. When we think of hope, one of our most common ways of thinking is that, is that hope is what we choose when, when we can't be certain, when we're not totally confident about something, it's, it's the way LaDonna and our children might have used the word at some point or another when I said, I'll be home at 5 o'clock to pick you up so we can be on time for your practice or your game. I'm sure at some point someone says, I hope he gets here on time. They hope because... My track record did not necessarily inspire confidence. There may have been one time that I may not have been exactly on time. I, I'm sure there were times their mother said to herself, I can't be confident, but I can still hope that this time it might happen. We know that's not how Paul is using this word because that kind of hope does nothing to create an environment of joy and peace, right? Hope, the way the Bible uses it, is, is talking about a confident expectation. A, a profound and unusually confident expectation. Something that is a sure bet 
the only sure bet because we know our hope story. Let's go back to how Paul begins this book. We saw it last week in our Easter teaching. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What is gospel? Gospel is good news. The, the good news reality, the good news story that Paul grew up hearing about being promised, but not seeing it happen. And it, the penny dropped in Paul's mind. And the fact that he sees that Jesus has been the fulfillment of that promise. The promise has been fulfilled in a person. And a person whose promise is validated because, well, in, in verse 3. The gospel regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. And who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he talks about this being the foundation of the story of hope. That's what Paul is going to help us see in the book of Romans, the, Romans, the good news of our story in Jesus. But the good news is, is only good news when we allow ourselves to know, to fully appreciate and be fully aware of the story that we were born into. And he spends four chapters reminding us of what our story was apart from Jesus. Chapter 1, he says that humanity exchanged God's story, God's truth, for our own story, the story where we are the center. And God said, okay, that's your choice. Have it your way. I won't force my way on you, but you will have to live with the consequences of making your story about you. And these four chapters can all be summarized from chapter, in chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned. We have lived less than and differently from how God created us to live. And as a result, we have fallen short of the glory that on our hearts we know we were created to know and experience and live in. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, Paul puts it this way, we were without and without God in the world. That was our story. That was our story. Beginning in chapter 5, Paul shows how in Jesus, that does not have to be our story anymore. He shows how Jesus rescued us from the prison of our story and why he did it. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. That's our story. And what does knowing this story and reminding of the, ourselves of this story do? Going on. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, the glory that we lost, 3 verse 23. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And this hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been giving, given to us. The whole purpose of all of this heady stuff and this deep doctrine is for us to remember and truly understand the, the, the reality and the robustness of the hope that is in our story. When was the last time that you said to someone, when they tried to, to remind you, help you see the implication of something in God's word, when was the last time you said, you don't have a clue about my story. You're not validating my story. Friends, when we say that, the thing we need to hear most, but we're not hoping to hearing, is this. Do you really know your story? 
when we hear those words coming out of our mouths, we need to learn to ask ourselves, do I really know my story? In Jesus, my story is that I was bought out of the prison of my story. I have allowed myself to be captured, imprisoned by the hope of a new story. One of the reasons this is my sending prayer for us is that at a time of, of, of change of, of leadership, th there can be two sets of feelings. Now, I've not seen these feelings to, to a great degree in, in Ellerslie at all, and I'm confident they're not there to a, a, a polarizing or a, a, a dysfunctional degree, but the one set of feelings is, oh my goodness, we, we just got comfortable with and maybe even a little bit confident in Mel, and now he's leaving. Friends, although I'm sure that's not a dominating feeling because I know as well as you do that Mel is not worth putting hope in. <laughs> but that kind of feeling puts too, pressure, too much pressure on the guy coming in. This is a great time to declare our hope is not in any human leader, in any human organization. Our hope is in Jesus. And the, the measure of any human leader is did he or did she help me see the hope of my story in Jesus and help me rest in that hope? The value, value of any human program is did it point me to Jesus and see my hope in Jesus? That's one reason why programs have to, have to change occasionally because we so easily begin to trust in the program, believe in the program. But there's another set of feelings that can emerge at a time like this. Whoa. Finally, Mel's gone, and now there's hope. Folks, that also puts undue pressure on the guy coming in. I want to tell you with confidence that I'm sure a few things will change, but there's one thing that won't change. And what you will hear from Dave and what I know Dave will, will, will want you to hold him accountable for is that this is our story, and it is the only true story of hope. All our hope is in Jesus. And the moment we begin, begin trusting a little too much in a program, in a person, in a decision we've made, in some kind of human environment, is the moment we begin to lose sight of, lose our strength in the hope that is in Jesus. How do I live in hope? Remember my hope story. May the God of hope Fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. Trust in him is just remembering, resting in what he has done for you in Jesus, the story of your hope. Allowing us, as Paul says, to have our minds be renewed. That's what he means in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Allow your minds to be renewed by seeing the story of hope in the mercy and grace of God. So, number two, what are the signs that I'm remembering my hope story? What's it going to look like? He goes on to say, may, God, may, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that you may overflow with hope. What does it mean to overflow? It doesn't mean you'll become gushy and bubbly and cheery and blabbery. It's not what it's talking about. It means that I will release my hope story to others. I will share with others in the way I live, in the words I say, in the things I do, in the attitudes I have. I will share my, my, the, with others the hope of my story. It will overflow to others. In the discussion that uh, Dave and I had earlier, he, he referred to our I cubed strategy, our I four strategy. Influence, invite, include, and invest. Which begins with influence. And influence is largely, simply living as people of hope in every single environment we have. I can't think of a better way to describe influence the influence that God is calling us to show in our world is, is hope. 
Really, there's, there's only one thing we need to ask ourselves as we, as we go to bed every night. Did I live my life today showing the story of the hope I have in Jesus? You know, we, we talked about how this benediction is a summary of the whole book of Romans, but it is most specifically a sending summary of, of chapters 12 to 15, which is all about loving, accepting, and serving one another. There are more of the, the one another commands in the Bible in Romans 12 to 15 than all of the rest of the Bible put together. The first sign that we're living in hope is that we are allowing the hope that Jesus has filled me with to overflow in love for others, putting others ahead of myself and not making all, it all about what I have to experience in my story. That's the first sign of hope. There's, there's other things that the, the Bible talks to and check, uh, talks about when it comes to hope signs that, that people will see, that we'll live as people of influence. Therefore, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we behave with boldness. Not a brash, arrogant, aggressive boldness that attacks people, but a grace-filled confidence that gives myself away, gives my life away to others. In the very next chapter, Paul says, he, I, I, I demonstrate that I'm dying to my own self-interest, my issues, so that life can emerge in others. The kind of boldness that Sarah Caitlin showed in her story in our Easter service last week, using my weakness to serve others with hope. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul talks about remembering before our God and Father as he thought of them, your work of faith, your labor of love, your endurance of hope, the commitment to, to just keep on serving faithfully, quietly, even when others get the attention. Endurance, faithfulness, quiet faithfulness is a, is a sign of hope and a way that we can influence our world with our hope. Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may comprehend the hope into which he has called you, the richness of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Dave talked about this last week in our Easter service, didn't he? Hope is, hope is actually living from my future. It inspires us to wait for those things that we think we need, that we have to have now, because we already have them in Jesus. Or as Paul puts it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory that people will see. Finally, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he, as he is pure. Getting past that, I am what I am, prison of defeat that I feel I'm doomed to. No. Hope empowers us to keep showing that I still believe the Holy Spirit in me calls me and empowers me to live in a different story, to deal with some of that stuff that I can't get over and that I still keep on doing and I know is wrong and I know is unproductive. We don't have to defend ourselves. We can keep growing. Are you choosing the prison of hope? As we close, let's, let's come back to the story that the way Paul began it in the book of Romans. Our, our hope, he says, is in the gospel, the good news story of Jesus, raised from the de dead, declared with power to be the Lord of the uni universe, the sovereign one of history. Living in hope does not mean experiencing Jesus perfectly now or ever on this earth, because the story of Jesus is not yet complete. But enough of it has happened that we know it's just a matter of time that it's going to be fully realized. We need to see, as, as we saw last year about this time from Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, where John says, look, open your eyes to see reality that he is coming. Not he will come, but he is already coming. He is on his way. 
You see, each of the chapters of Jesus' life is really only completely understood in light of the last chapter. As Daryl Johnson puts it in a sermon that he uh, preached on 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the, pur the, the purpose of Jesus' death is incomplete. Or, sorry, the purpose of Jesus' birth is incomplete without his teaching and healing ministry. The purpose of Jesus' teaching and healing ministry is incomplete without his death on the cross. The, the purpose of his death on the cross is incomplete without his resurrection from the grave. The purpose of his resurrection from the grave is incomplete without his ascension to the right hand of authority of the throne of the Father. And the purpose of his ascension to the throne is incomplete without this pouring out of the Holy Spirit on us at Pentecost. And the purpose of his pouring out the Holy Spirit is incomplete without seeing him coming again in his glory. It was the first Monday of the first week of December 1986. I remember that because it was board meeting night in the first year that I was a lead pastor. My mother, who had been suddenly widowed a year earlier and who decided that winter driving on the highway was not wise, was coming to our place on the bus to spend several days. The bus was scheduled to arrive at 9.30 in the evening and I got permission from the board chair that regardless of how long the meeting went, I could leave to pick up my mother at the bus station. I left the meeting a little late only to discover as I left the building that the snowfall that had begun that afternoon had become a major dump. Huge flakes, it was right around freezing, and by now it felt as I was leaving the parking lot that you were plowing your way down the road. I got to the bus station a little late to a crowd of waiting people. I discovered that the bus had been stopped about 30 kilometers west of town at the bottom what, of what in Alberta we would call a coulee. A power line had become too heavy laden with snow and was sagging to the point that no traffic was able to get through. I visualized my mother on that bus sitting in the snowstorm and I decided that I was not going to allow her to be stranded in a storm. I plowed my way down the highway 20 some kilometers only to be stopped about a kilometer from the top of the hill going down into the coulee, the last car in a long line. I sat there for only a minute, I don't sit long, and I realized that since the traffic was blocked both ways, nobody else was using the other lane and it needed some guiding ruts anyway, and so I moved into the wrong lane and drove past all of the parked cars to the front of the line where there were two police officers and a parked police cruiser blocking any traffic. I got out of the, off, off, uh, out of the car and they said rather abruptly, sorry, can't go any further. And I said, sir, on the bottom of that hill on the other side of a power line, is a line of vehicles like this line. And in that line is a Greyhound bus. And they said, yes, there is, but it's going nowhere. And I said, yeah, that's my problem. That's why I have to go down there because my mother is in that bus. She's a widow and she's a senior. Well, although she was not technically a senior at that time, she was my senior and, and I was sure being stuck in the storm was, was aging her very quickly. I said, I need to get down that hill. I promise I won't drive under the power line, but I have to go down and get her from that bus. The two officers looked at each other and I was about to say, what would you do if it was your mother? But they said, okay, but don't do anything stupid. I was glad they let me go because I also had one more line that I was going to use, but only if I really had to. I was ready to pull out the pastor card and say, you know, there's a high likelihood that there are people on that bus who would like someone to pray with them. I was loaded. There was nothing going to stop me from getting my mom. Anyway, I get to the bottom of the hill and to the down line about six feet from the ground. 
And the third vehicle back was a Greyhound bus. I walked under that down line, up to the bus, I banged on the door, and the driver opened the door and I said, I believe you have a woman named Katie Fair on this bus. I'm her son, and I've come to take her home. And my mother, who was halfway to the back of the bus, heard her name and recognized my voice. And she let out a whoop-de-doo. She picked up her stuff, and as she walked down the aisle, the whole bus was cheering. And when she stopped, stepped onto the ground and gave me a hug, there was an even bigger cheer. And she said, I thought you'd come. Folks, if I would do that for my mother, do you not think that's what the Jesus who died for you is doing right now? He's on his way. And that means that hope is my story now. So two questions. Number one, how have you been saying to yourself, you know, I've lost hope because. Or perhaps you're saying, I could be hopeful if. Or, or even, I am now hopeful because, and, and it's some this world level thing which can be taken away. It is at that point that God is saying to you, won't you remember your true hope story? Number two, how might God be calling you to let, let your hope overflow? Even though you don't feel hopeful, you can choose hope. And, and you can make a meal for someone, not someone whose attention you need, but someone you might feel might need a little bit of an encouragement of hope. Make a phone call to someone. Not, not someone whom you need to hear from to get some encouragement from, but someone who you just feel needs some encouragement just to let you know you were thinking of them. Maybe share something you saw them do to encourage them. One of the things I've sensed as people talk about our journey the last several years here is that Ellerslie has become a hope-filled environment. That is the most encouraging thing to me. It's not because of a person other than Jesus. It's because together we have seen and believed and rehearsed our story of hope together. And we're giving ourselves to, to releasing our story of hope to others. By God's grace, my benediction my sending prayer to you is keep choosing together the prison of hope. Remember your hope story and just release your hope story every single day to everyone you meet. So let's pray. Benediction. May the God of hope keep on filling you and filling this body with all joy and peace as you live believingly, seeing and trusting in Jesus and Jesus only so that your hope will overflow in your neighborhoods, in your networks by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you.